Well, this is like the security access of evil uh, right in front of me. <laughs> hey guys, uh, welcome back. Yelmer, are we live again? Sorry, we broke the stream. Or um, uh, Lucas broke the, uh, broke the stream by presenting uh, too much code on one slide. But <laughs> seriously, we love um, live coding. And um, uh, if you want to present on, on Sake and you want to do live coding, we really, uh, really applaud that. But there's one thing that's even cooler than live coding. <laughs> and that is? <laughs> yes, live hacking. And yeah, that's where we bring in our, uh, our favorite uh, security um, uh, company, uh, which we've been working for Sanoma for m many years already, um, and uh, found really embarrassing bugs. <laughs> I also have to admit myself uh, in, in, uh, in stuff uh, prior to launching it. Um, so uh, we've debated a lot in, in preparation for this um, on what site should be the target, but then Unfortunately, we chickened out <laughs> and decided not to bring down Telegraph.nl. Um, oh. But <laughs> maybe if we did this after dinner and uh, after we drank more of those wonderful beers that uh, Arjen um, uh, arranged for us, then uh, we, we might have decided to do otherwise. But now um, you're going to do some live hacking. So um, Dan, please take it away. Round of applause for Dan. So, I thought I would start this uh, talk by uh, giving you a short story. Um, the story takes place in the uh, first year of this century, um, when Vodafone of Greece um, received <coughs> a complaint by customers that they didn't receive tech message, text messages on their mobile phone. So, Vodafone was unable to uh, identify the problem. Um, so what they did, they sent the firmware dumps of their telephone switches to Ericsson um, for further analysis. And what Ericsson found was that um, the firmware was backdoored. There were uh, 65,000 lines of code that have been modified or added to the original firmware. Um, with the only purpose to um, wiretap a hundred mobile phone uh, numbers in uh, Athens. Um, and exactly it were the mobile phone numbers of the Prime Minister, um, Minister of Defense, etc., etc. Um, and the firmware was adjusted in such a way that all that, uh, all phone calls that were made to that numbers uh, were actually also broadcasted to <coughs> 14 uh, anonymous mobile phone numbers. So, yeah, the, the story has a, a, a lifespan of uh, more than 10 years. Uh, the guy who supposedly was involved in this uh, was only identified uh, last year. Um, but since then, a lot of cool stuff happened. Uh, one of the things was that the, um, the firmware that uh, was present on the telephone switches was programmed in the PAX programming language. It's a programming language that is only uh, understood by about 10 guys in the world. It's very obscure, only used for a specific type of telephone switch. Um, so one of those 10 guys must have inside knowledge or uh, have an extra agenda. Um, the day after this news became public, um, the head of uh, network operation of Vodafone uh, was killed under um, and well, rare circumstances. Uh, they think it's suicide, but well, the family thinks otherwise. He th they think he's poisoned. Um, so, yeah, I d well, at the end they identified the guy because uh, three phones were purchased at the same address at the same time when one of the uh, US uh, NSA employees also bought a London telephone uh, for embassy purposes which was a little bit silly, if you ask me. Um, but the guy responsible for purchasing the phones is, uh, uh, has gone into hiding since. Um, so they have no way of actually determining if he is the guy and if the US Embassy was indeed behind this, uh, uh, this espionage. So the reason why I'm telling this story is because, well, it was the um, early 2000s. Um, I was just uh, in high school and I wanted to do that. I wanted to be the guy that could hack any system, uh, of course. 
Um, so I started my career by uh, following a normal uh, computer science study uh, and focusing on, the, on security. These are just some of the stuff uh, I've done or currently do. Um, I work as a security specialist for Pine. Um, who of you ever, well, at least know us or have read a report from us? Excellent. <laughs> So, who is a little bit ashamed about some of the vulnerabilities we identified in, in your code? <laughs> okay, excellent. So, apart from uh, security testing and code audits, we also do some managed hosting and some security development. So, of course, your world is uh, about coding new uh, uh, or developing new web apps or mobile apps or desktop applications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but today, I would like to give you a well, a sneak preview into our world, um, where uh, well, the world of security uh, and, I, and hacking. So, I've built a uh, web application and it contains a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, this will be an easy talk for me because if everything goes as planned, you will do all the work. Um, I will just go to a URL <coughs> and after that, you have to decide what to do next. So the total challenge is rather big, so I have no idea if we managed to hack the entire application, but at least we'll uh, uh, get to a fairly, over to a decent point uh, where we maybe can finish the app of the challenge in a uh, future presentation. Yeah? Okay. So, without further ado, I don't have a lot of slides because I think security should be practical. Um, This is the application. Can everybody read the screen? Or maybe we can make it a little bit bigger. Let's see. Okay. So, this is the application. And our first goal will be to obtain <coughs> an admin account on this application. Yeah? Okay, so what would be your first step? Admin password. Just admin. Login, admin password. Okay, so just try a password. No. <coughs> Any other ideas? Admin, admin. Okay, let's first start with admin, admin. Nope. <coughs> okay. Source codes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? Network calls. Uh, I have BERT for this, which is a uh, proxy tool. Uh, let's see, maybe we can make the so add to scope. So, oh, okay, that didn't work. Okay, so these are all the requests that are going to the web application. Any re requests you want to see? So this post form, right? Okay, so this is the raw request we are sending. Yeah, and this is the response. Just tell me when to stop scrolling. Or Any ideas? What to do next? Uh, semicolon or one is one. Semicolon or one is one. SQL injection. So admin and then uh, semicolon here yeah. or oh, in the password or yeah uh, yeah. Uh, yeah or one is one so basically I'm doing this yeah or one is one yeah, yeah? will this work <coughs> I want to do it in the password uh, in the password field okay why do you want to do it in the password field. Password, but one is one is true. 
Okay, so you're targeting at SQL <coughs> injection, right? So most likely in the background, the application will do something like select everything from uh, users where uh, username is. Something like this, right? And if this returns a result, you will have a valid uh, uh, pass username password combination. If it doesn't work, uh, it doesn't return any results. Uh, you don't have minus, minus. Minus, minus. So the theory is that um, if we have SQL injection, of course, we can inject arbitrary SQL statements. Yeah? So if we inject um, or one is one, like this, that's not going to work. Um, but of course, we can just ignore the rest by just adding a comment. Yeah? So, or like this. Yeah, if we can do, if we can inject arbitrary SQL statements, we could then s do something like this. Yeah. Select everything from users where the username is equal to admin or something else, or one is equal to one. And everything else is just SQL comments. Yeah? So this would return, what, actually, what would this return? All users. All users, yeah. And for most applications, that will mean that you log in as the first user in the, in the table. Yeah, and um, typically the first user is the admin user, of course. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so um, something like this, right? Okay. The password doesn't matter anymore because we'll commit it out anyway. Ah, <laughs> that's a pity. Okay. So. Wes, any other ideas? Okay, yeah, cool. Some other comments. Products, okay, let's go to products. Nope, kind of click product. News? Token fields. So, why would we remove the token? So, just skip the news for now. So, you're thinking that this token will actually be, <coughs> will check if the username and password is correct. Yeah, sort of like client side authentication. Okay, so any other thoughts about what this token might be? Yeah, correct. I'm guessing this is the cross-site request forgery token. Yeah. Um, so cross-site request forgery <coughs> is a attack where I can make another user submit any form I like, uh, after which the application will process that form. Um, so I can make him do arbitrary stuff on the website. Um, but let's not talk about cross-site request forgery today. Um, <laughs> but you're correct. This token is for cross-site request forgery. Yeah, so it not, has nothing to do with authentication. Okay, so. Is there a CGI bin uh, slash S? CGI bin? <laughs> Question mark slash S? Question mark? Oh, that was our bug. Uh, yeah, so during a CTF, so I'm a member of the Einbase CTF team. Uh, we play hacking competitions, or at least we used to play a hacking competition. Um, so a couple of years ago, we found a vulnerability in uh, PHP. Um, actually, we're participating in one of the competitions, uh, and we found an unpatched vulnerability in PHP, uh, which allows us to execute arbitrary code on a random PHP of a server that uh, uses PHP. Um, so, uh, yeah, of course we use that to hack the scoreboard to make us permanently number one. <coughs> so we won that competition. Um, 
but here it doesn't work, unfortunately. No. <laughs> okay, so we had news. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay. So, same message. So, sorry. Robots file. Okay, so I think everybody knows the robots file. Um, of course, you can hide directories for search engines here or files. And if you want to hide it from search engines, I as an attacker are especially curious what is in this file and why don't, don't, you, want it, uh, don't you want Google to know. So, <laughs> slash WAF. Okay, so <coughs> who knows what WAF stands for? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so it's a piece of software um, that you place between your web application and uh, the public internet, and it does some request filtering. Yeah, it sees if you are a malicious user, um, and if so, it will drop the request or make a notification, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Of course, I can disable. Click the disable button. Ah. <laughs> That would have been too easy. <laughs> okay, so what's next? Can you somehow figure out the exact version of PHP, for example? Uh, actually, we can because it's in the response headers. Um, but I'm going to tell you in advance. Uh, but this is just a latest Ubuntu version, so <laughs> let's not uh, spend any time on that. SQL injection on the PHP session ID. Yeah, you can try that, of course. So this is our session ID. Yeah, we can just inject. What do you would you like to inject? <coughs> Any thoughts? Well, we can start by by looking if it's at least vulnerable by saying or sleep ten. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, if it sleeps, we have SQL injection. If it doesn't sleep, uh, no, it doesn't really sleep. I make an ant. See if that works. Also, it doesn't work. Um, any other thoughts? So you want to try to log in again? Yeah. Okay. So we add admin password, admin admin. Okay. So. I understood that we only have one hour, so I'm going to try one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> and if this is not the password, we're going to try something else, okay? Okay, so apparently this admin has a very strong password because we get in, well, we don't have it in three attempts. And in the movies, you always see that the third attempt <laughs> is always the password, so. <laughs> okay. Register globals. Oh, that brings back memories. Yeah, that brings back memories. Okay, so what are we going to do with register globals? Well, we can, of course, have a look. Let's see. So, <coughs> let's see, removed, uh, unfortunately. It was such a nice feature. <laughs> okay, 
Any other thoughts? What can we do? Oh, nice. Let's just save this for a bit for later reference. <laughs> okay. So, uh, sorry, the buff. Yeah. <coughs> Oh, just a JavaScript <coughs> pop-up, correct, yeah, okay. So, uh, of course, we can look at the source code. Before we click the button, yeah. so nothing out of the ordinary, right? Correct, missing something, okay. Good. <coughs> Let me just click the button. So, it added this line. Yeah? So I'm guessing this happens server-side. Yeah? And not client-side. But it was a good theory, of course. It would be client-side authentication. Okay? Any other thoughts? Can we request a new ID that doesn't exist? So you could call some kind of error? We'll just give you an empty, oh. So. Okay, it will just give you an empty news page. Make it a letter, of course we can do that. Make it this. <coughs> okay. Euro and code, oh man. Okay, so. Let's see. Oh, what is the a quote is twenty seven. Okay, so let's try this. Of course, you can also try double encoding. Who knows what percentage twenty five is? Percentage. Yeah, so Apache will decode this once, and maybe PHP will decode it a second time, and you will get a quote. Yeah. Let's go. Ah, there it goes. No. Okay, so what other cross site scripting? Okay, so how would cross site scripting help us in here? Yeah, okay, so we email admin, but then what, what will <coughs> cross-site scripting do for us? We could change his password. Can, cha can we change the password? Well, if, he, if he were to use cross-site scripting, yeah. this would work like a, if you post something that you isn't aware of. Uh, that's a, that is cross-site request forgery. So who can explain to me what cross-site scripting is? No, I Okay, so <laughs> there are all things you can do with cross-site scripting, but the previous question was, what is cross-site scripting? You have to have to read it in our, our reports, otherwise. <coughs> okay, sorry? You inject some code. Yeah. Correct. So cross-site scripting is if I can inject JavaScript code into the page. Yeah. And that would help me that, uh, in the way that if an admin, pa admin would visit that page yeah, containing the JavaScript, my malicious JavaScript, I can do anything I want in his session. Yeah, because he is opening, he's viewing the JavaScript in his browser. He has an active session on the site. Yeah? So anything he can do, I can do. Using JavaScript and Ajax calls, et cetera, et cetera. And everything he can read, I can read too. I can just use Ajax to send it to my server. Yeah. So if we have a cross-site scripting vulnerability, um, then we could trick the admin user into, well, what can we make the admin user do? Create more users, Create more users but specific in this application? Disable the, Disable the firewall. Yeah, so if we have cross-site scripting somewhere, yeah, we can maybe inject some JavaScript, um, and if the admin page, if the admin user will see that page, we can use that to disable the web application firewall. Yeah, I haven't lost anyone. 
OK, so yeah, where are we going to try cross-site scripting? It doesn't matter as long as it shows up here. It doesn't matter. OK, so what are we going to do? Okay, so so this is the theory, yeah? If we insert a quote, it will get in the request overview from the web, from the web application firewall, yeah? So if we add some JavaScript to the request, yeah, maybe it will show up here and will execute the JavaScript code, yeah, rather than print it on screen. Yeah. Okay, so let's see if this works. Bummer. <laughs> okay, it doesn't work. So it's URL encoded. Okay, so anything we can do about this or any other place we might be able to trick cross site script? Sorry? Sorry? Commenting session. Um, actually, I don't think so. I think we already viewed the entire site. So this was news. Let's see news, which had a read more, but that was also only just news web products. We couldn't do anything there. We had a login page. Okay. So you're something like this. Uh, no, okay, well I can have a look, but it's just a static page containing some products. Yeah. Okay, so you want to inject some JavaScript here? Yeah. So we can first inject the JavaScript here. Um, we can then have a look at the so this is the raw request we're sending. So and as you can see, it's just contains admin and alert, uh, alert attack. It's URL encoded because, well, it has to be URL encoded. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So we had the script to the, the form action? The form action. So you actually want to post the form to some somewhere else? <coughs> so like this. Yeah. So, okay, of course we can do that. Of course we can have a look if... What's the slash background? The slash backgrounds. Okay. It's just uh, encoded. So not cross-site scripting. Uh, slash background, it will show you a random background. Yeah. OK, any other theories? What does the disable button do? The disable button, good question. Uh, when you press the disable button, what well, can you just have a look, of course. It will do. Do a post request to slash pop, and it will embed the token. And it's probably just a toggle. Yeah, if you do a post once, it will disable. If you do a post again, it will re -enable, enable the love. Yeah? Okay, so are there any other places on this website where our user input is shown on screen? Because, of course, that's needed for cross site scripting, right? Nope. And of course, the web application firewall kicks in as soon as you inject something malicious. Uh, so we get a hacking attempt. OK. Any other theories where our user input might be printed on page? Here. Sorry, where? Yeah, here. Here. Yeah, but that's just a request overview, right? Can we play with the reference? Sorry, with the? Okay, is, but is it printed somewhere? So it has to be printed somewhere on page, right? Okay, so 
IP address. Can we change an IP address to contain cross site scripting? Yeah? Ah, okay, so how would that work? Yeah, so why is this, <coughs> what does this header do, x44? I think it's used by a bus here and next to communicate to So in this entire presentation, I have four more slides, and these are three of them. So proxies. So when I, as a user, visit a web application, uh, the web application, of course, knows my IP address, yeah, because I'm making a TCP connection with the uh, web server. Um, however, if you have a proxy in between the user and the web application, um, Depending on the type of proxy, of course, yeah, a proxy can also be a load balancer. It can operate on OC layer two, three, or uh, seven, uh, or it can do SSL offloading, for ex uh, example. But in some cases, the uh, proxy or load balancer will establish a new connection with the web server. Yeah. So the user will go to the load balancer, and the load balancer will create a new connection to the web server. Yeah. So this is a problem because. Um, in this situation, the web server only sees one IP address. Yeah. All the users are coming from the IP address that actually belongs to the proxy. Yeah. So you lose the original IP address. So for this, most proxies will set an extra header, the X44 header, which will contain the original IP address that it forwarded the request for. Um, so, and if you look at web applications, most web applications are built in such a way that you can deploy them in a wide variety of environments. Yeah, so the application <coughs> should also work when deployed behind a load balancer. Yeah, so what most applications will do is they will check if the X44 header is present. If so, pick that IP address. If not, take the IP address from the IP session. Yeah? Okay. Well, obviously, uh, we can just set this header ourselves. So, this was one of the requests that was, that would end up in the web application firewall, right? Okay, so. <coughs> so, of course, we shouldn't alert the uh, admin user because then he will instantly know something is up. So let's just change our IP address to something and just add some harmless HTML tags. Yeah, let's just see if this works. So the request will be dropped and if we look in the request overview you will see it's added our it's changed the IP address to the IP address from the HTTP header. And it indeed contained the HTML tags. Yeah? Okay, so we have cross-site scripting. Yeah? What are we going to inject? Okay, so... Please tell me, what are we going to inject? Alert? Yeah, we will, then we'll, the admin will know something's up. <laughs> uh, check, check if the current text is uh, disabled and then toggle the button. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so the current ID of the form is WAF disable. Yeah, so we can just submit that form, right? Okay, so any front enders in the room today? Okay, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> <laughs> So, sorry? Uh, get an element by ID, I guess. Something like this, right? Yeah. Not made any spelling mistake? 
Yeah, if we and if we didn't have jQuery, we could just include jQuery, but that would be a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <coughs> now we have to wait until the admin shows up. So let me just help you a bit. I knew it all along. Okay, let's see. Ah, yes, <coughs> it's disabled. Of course, I cannot re-enable it because it's <laughs> constantly submitting the, uh, <laughs> toggling the button. So, of course, we can make this, uh, uh, we have JavaScript, so we can change the text, of course. We can make it say that's currently enabled. Well, it's actually disabled. Uh, basically, we can do anything we want. Um, this was a real vulnerability, by the way, we found uh, during one of our security tests. Um, okay, so we don't no longer have the buff to worry about. So what's next? Sorry? <coughs> Steal the cookie. So in some situations we can use JavaScript to just get the contents of the uh, session cookie and just submit that session cookie to us and then we can take over a session. Um, what's the common technique that you as a developer can use to prevent this from happening? Sorry? HTTP yeah, make the session cookie HTTP only. Yeah, it's just a little flag you can put on a cookie and uh, it will tell the browser that this cookie is unaccessible by JavaScript. But of course, I have JavaScript in a session, so I can make it persistent, I can make it do anything. Uh, I actually want, yeah. But, okay, so he was a web application firewall admin, but that's maybe something different than the actual admin user. So, what's next? Sorry? News, okay. Uh, with a random ID? Uh, with, uh, 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 let's first start with this. Oh, uh, let's see if it works. We can do quotes. Okay, so first we got a hacking attempt and that's uh, no longer the case. So at least we have confirmed that we disabled the uh, web. Oh, admin login, okay. So admin, or one is one, comment. Yeah, okay. see if this works. No, doesn't work. What's next? SQL injection in the news page. So like here. Okay, so what are we going to inject? <coughs> and the SQL statements? How do we do that? Semicolon, okay, yeah. And then the users table, maybe you can do a select star from the users table. Select, like this. at the source, of course. <coughs> Doesn't really contain anything. Okay, so the semicolon. Um, anybody know how that's called in SQL? The technique behind it? It's called stacked queries. Um, and the library, the connect connection library uh, has to support stacked queries. And by default, most of them do not. Uh, in PHP, they also don't support stacked queries uns unless you specifically enable it. Yeah, so it's, but it's disabled in most configurations. Yeah? So that's possibly the reason why this doesn't work. The other reason can be that the table is not called users. 
also a possibility. Yeah. Any other techniques we can maybe we can use? Yeah, try, try joining or something. By joining, okay. How would that work? Join users that on one is one. That won't work because you're in the where statement already. Yeah. So most likely it will be something like select everything from news where ID is input. Right? Yeah. Okay. So um, a join is al already well. Then you have to be in a from class. So that's a union, okay. What does a union do? Combines what? Sorry. Okay, two record sets. Okay, so union and then select from. Okay, from select other something from users. Show table. Will show tables work in this case? No, they have to. Yeah, correct. Can you figure out what database it is and get something from the metadata? If you can somehow output something to the screen, you can get something like from PDA tables or whatever it is, or a whole word. Yeah. That way you can figure out what the table name is for. Yeah. Now you just have to come up with a query. Yeah, correct. So we need something before this, actually. Select one, comma, two, comma, three, comma, two. Ah. Correct. So my first step would be to see if this is actually injectable. Yeah, and you have a couple of techniques. Um, if this is an integer, I would see what news. Oh, sorry. What news I? Ah, what news item two is? Yeah. And I would do three minus one. Yeah. If this returns the same news item, I'm pretty certain that this is SQL injection. Yeah, because the three minus one will get evaluated <coughs> by uh, SQL. Okay. So in this case, we have SQL injection. Yeah. The other technique is when it's a string rather than an integer. This won't work, of course. Um, I would do and one is one. Actually, we can also make it like this. <coughs> we'll just, oh, so. Yeah, there isn't a third news item. OK, so I would do and one is one. Yeah, because this is, and one is equal to one. So this is true. So I'll select everything from news where ID is equal to two and true. And then I will do and one is equal to two. Yeah, which is, of course, false. Yeah, so this shouldn't return anything. Yeah. Okay, it also works. Yeah, so we have confirmed SQL injection. Yeah. Okay, next step would be to determine the number of columns that have been selected. Yeah, as previously stated, if you want to <coughs> use a union, the left hand side should return an equal amount of columns than the right hand side. Yeah, the, the types don't have to be equal. Yeah, it will just cast everything to a string or something. I don't know. Um, it's only the number of columns. So we as hackers are lazy, of course, by nature. Um, so we want to determine this as quickly as possible. Um, and the easiest way is to use order by. Yeah, order by is just to order the result set. And typically, you would give it a column name. But you can also give it a column number, because we don't know the names of the columns, of course. Uh, but you can also give it a column number. So what I would typically do is say, OK, order it by column number 10. So this doesn't return any results, yeah? which gives me the information that there are less than 10 columns currently being selected. Yeah, OK. so. So we can do a nice binary search. Ah, five, <coughs> that works. Yeah, so at least five columns are currently selected. Yeah. Uh, well, seven. 
six. Okay, so six, six columns have been selected. Um, the next step is determine which columns will be printed on screen. Because of course, not all columns that come in the result set have to be printed. Um, and of course, if we want to steal the username and password combinations, we have to have a column that's actually printed on screen. Yeah. So what you already said is you could use, yeah, select one, two. Does anybody know what select one does? Yeah, and select one, comma two. Yeah, it will collect, really return a single row with just the numbers one and the numbers two. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't see anything. What's up? Yeah. So most likely it will only print the first row that gets returned. Yeah, so um, there are a couple of techniques. First, we can change the order, um, but the most easiest way is to just make this minus two. Yeah, make sure the first query doesn't return anything. Cool, excellent. Okay, what's the next step? Table name and column name. Okay. So always take small steps because if we immediately do both the column, uh, the table of the column name, sorry, and the table name, and the result doesn't work, we don't know if the column name was incorrect or the table name was incorrect. Yeah. So we'll go first guess the table name. Yeah. And typically that's easy because it's almost always users. Yeah? <coughs> Okay, still returns a result. So it will indeed be users. If we take a non-existing <coughs> table name, it won't return anything. So user it, it is. Uh, so suppose we couldn't guess the table name. What would be uh, our other options? The metadata yeah, correct. So for MySQL, for example, you have the information scheme, database, um, just some bookkeeping uh, and will tell you exactly what tables exist, uh, what the column types are, the column names, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. But in this case, it's easy. Okay. So, um, in that case, it will most likely be username and password. Yeah. Cool. You could have guessed this actually. <laughs> Okay, and so what time do I have, actually? Well, we're one minute uh, overdue, but okay. I think everyone wants to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, but the entire challenge will take at least a, uh, an hour longer. So um, maybe we come back uh, another time and show you the rest of the challenge. Yeah? Okay, um, well, thank you for listening. Um, thank you. I Eddie? have another appointment, unfortunately, so uh, I won't be around for questions after uh, this presentation. My colleague Jalmer is uh, uh, with me today, so you can all ask all technical questions to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you have any questions current already, then uh, we're glad to answer them. <coughs> yeah. uh, why would you prefer <coughs> password, not guess? Um, and what, what would be the next step? So, the, okay, do I have two more minutes? Yes, yes. Okay, I have two more minutes. Okay, so, of course, you need to hash the passwords. That's step one. Oh, please repeat oh. the question. Sorry. Um, the question was, why are the passwords stored in plain text in the database, and shouldn't you use hashing you know, to protect the passwords? And the answer is yes. Um, but also, we see a lot of things going wrong with hashing. Uh, the first step is you need to hash the passwords. Yeah, so use a strong hashing algorithm like uh, uh, SHA-2, uh, or for instance, to hash the passwords. So, but the problem is if you only hash the password, of course, is that 
at Pine or at our office. We have a big machine with a lot of hard disk space, and we already hashed all passwords uh, up to, I think, 11, 12 characters or something. Um, so if we have a database table containing passwords, uh, we can just do a lookup. OK, this hash, what was the password? So that's one of the reasons we are always telling you make a pass phrase and make the password longer, not less character but more complex. Just make the password 25 characters or something. So that's step one. Um, and to, uh, uh, to prevent you from us using those rainbow tables, you of course need to add a salt. Yeah, just a random text string that uh, will make sure that our dictionary attack doesn't no longer work. Yeah, we have to hash for the password 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but not for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 plus 60 random <coughs> characters. Yeah? So that's important. But besides the amount of hard disk space we have in this machine, we also have a lot of graphic cards in the same machine. Because graphic cards are tremendously fast when it comes to calculating hashes. So if we have a hash with the appropriate salt, we can crack a uh, password hash up to eight characters in less than a day. Yeah. So if you have an admin password that's eight <coughs> characters or less, give us a day and we have the password for you. Um, so that's the reason why we also um, advise you to use stretching. Yeah. And stretching is that you don't only hash the password a single time, but you hash the result of that a second time. And you do that about 5,000 times, for example. Yeah? Or 10,000 or 100,000, just what's, uh, uh, well, unless you hit a performance penalty. Um, so the reason for this is I, as an attacker, also need to hash the password 5,000 times before I can compare if it's correct. So uh, the attack that took me a day in the old situation now takes me 5,000 days to get the same results. Um, and then there's something with a global salt or pepper, uh, but I won't go into that for now. Um, <coughs> bottom uh, line is use some password hashing mechanism like uh, Scrypt or Bcrypt, something that's already available in your framework uh, and that will do the stretching, salting, etc. It will do it for you. Yeah. But good question. Any other questions? Final question before Final question? dinner? <laughs> yeah, that's also a hex cracking, so uh, we could do that, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Bitcoin hashing is currently done on specific hardware, it's no longer be done on uh, graphic cards, uh, so no, no uh, Bitcoin mine. If this, if you're working at Sonoma and this still contains some new stuff, then talk to your manager or directly to Sergei <laughs> um, for an exit uh, review. No, no, um, the series to, um, uh, in the past we organized like um, hacker mindset training, uh, also provided by Pine. Yeah. Um, that cool. contains like most of this s uh, stuff. Um, yeah. So uh, if this contains still new items, uh, let's see if we can bring a group together and organize an in-house training for, yeah. um, uh, for doing that again. Because uh, yeah, this is like the minimum stuff. This uh, minimal stuff. The rest of the challenge contains a lot of new vulnerabilities that you probably haven't heard of or new techniques that you haven't seen. Um, so yeah. those okay. are interesting as well. Uh, please another round of applause for Dan. Thank you. Um, and for the viewers at home, we have a, a, a slightly sh a shorter break, uh, but we will return at um, a quarter to seven. Enjoy.